For more, we are joined by Sarah Yan. She's an associate director at Control Risks. Sarah, since the country's founding in 1948, the military has never suffered such significant and widespread battlefield setbacks. What pivotal factors do you think have led to this? Yes, so this is indeed the, possibly the most challenging period faced by the military. And there are certain parallels with the previous military regime in the 1990s, but there are also some significant differences. So as mentioned, now it's facing multiple concurrent and sustained attacks by the ethnic armed groups along the border regions. And while the fighting along the periphery is not new, what is new is that the military is also being challenged in the ethnic Burma heartlands of Yangon and Naypyidaw. And, they and these um, rebel groups have yet to step up their offensives. So it will, this is a situation that will bear watching. And secondly, the military's internal unity is being challenged, and this is yet another departure from the 1990s. At the junior levels, there have been large-scale defections, and at the leadership level, Senior General Min Aung Lang has placed a few of his close aides under house arrest or investigation for corruption charges, including Mo Mian Tun, who was widely touted as his successor, and this situation is kind of indicative of potential factionalism and rivalry within the junta. So it is another situation that we will have to watch very closely. At the same time, it is important not to underestimate the military staying power. Because despite these issues, we have seen the military prevailing so far, because even with these vulnerabilities, in the conflict with the resistance forces and the ethnic armed groups, the, the situation remains largely skewed in the military's favour. It retains considerable advantages in access to weaponry and firepower, particularly its ability to conduct airstrikes. For example, even while it's being under so much pressure, it managed to recapture a town in Rakhine State that was captured by the Arakan army last week. So where does this bring us? And is there a prospect of the military surrendering? So in, in our view, it is unlikely and there are no indications of this happening in any of the scenarios that control risk has because the stakes are simply too high for the military. The biggest barrier to this is that the ethnic armed groups and the People's Defence Forces are not united. While the People's Defence Forces goal is to overthrow the regime, each of the ethnic armed groups are acting in their self-interest. They are opportunistically trying to seize upon the military's vulnerability at this point in time to expand the territory and compel the military to the negotiating table, such that the military will cede more territory to them. And given that the military is facing multiple attacks and want to be, wants to be weakened, avoid being weakened on so many fronts, some of these groups may succeed. But at the end of the day, the military still remains the strongest in terms of firepower. So it is likely to still prevail in most of these conflicts. The long and short of this is that we will likely continue to see a cycle of violence and instability in Myanmar, but the situation remains very fluid and there are no indications yet that the military will concede. Now, talking about the ethnic armed groups, uh, how well resourced are they? And are you saying that their ambitions are not necessarily to overthrow the military, just to gain a greater pieces of autonomy for the regions that they operate in? That's right. So in, for each of these ethnic armed groups, they're not necessarily united because they are all opportunistically looking, opportunistically looking out for their self-interest, meaning they only want to seek control over each of those areas in which they have an area of um, control in those various regions, border areas in Shan State, Rakhine and Chin. So they don't necessarily have the wherewithal or firepower to overthrow the military as a as a and because of this asymmetry that they they recognize, they only they, their ambitions are very more much more modest than say the People's Defense Forces, which actually does want to overthrow the military. All right. And also, Sarah, with its reputation at stake, as you mentioned, the junta is unlikely to concede easily. I mean, there are even reports that they could resort to chemical weapons. I mean, how far do you think they'll go to crush the rebellion? It will definitely fight tooth and nail to remain in power because the stakes are simply too high for it to fail. And I, the reality is that the, 
the military still wants to hold elections, even though it, this has been a moving target and it's it has to first instill stability before it can hold elections. And even though the current target is um, as late as 2025, this remains one of the top things that the military wants to do. And there are no indications that uh, it's being forced into any actions that will cause it to concede in any significant form. So where does that leave the National Unity Government then? Are they playing a role in this, uh, Myanmar, now that Myanmar has a challenge to the military's rule through the ethnic armed groups? The National Unity Government, uh, so the um, um, part of the National Unity Government is the People's Defence Forces. And they are currently still lying low in terms of, there are some attacks that are being staged in the urban city centres of Yangon, Nepidon and Mandalay. But these are still relatively um, of low intensity. And that's the reason why th we will still need to see how the situation unfolds. Because as the People's Defence Forces see the military being under attack in all the various border regions, it will also sense an opportunity to escalate the violence and also try to see where it can get some advantages in the urban areas. Mm. But a... um, at the same time, because, sorry. Please go ahead, sorry. Um, so at the same time, while it's still trying to assess the situation and gain certain advantages, there are still so many advantages in the military's favor. So unless there is a major um, trigger that causes the military to come to the negotiating table. And this could range from, say, um, and say internal challenges to the military's unity, such as uh, a, an internal coup. We still don't see any signs of uh, anything that will compel the military to come to the table. And there are some experts say now is the time for Myanmar's pro-democracy resistance to push hard and for their international supporters to crank up the pressure on the junta uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, this is indeed um, an opportunity for the, the People's Defense Forces to step up their attacks. And um, what we are likely to see is that the military will, being under pressure on so many fronts, there will be times where the military will decide to negotiate with specific groups, such as the ethnic armed groups, because it has to retreat to... Um, protect its uh, advantage in the urban city areas where it has the strongest control. Um, its control along the periphery has always been weak, even in the 1990s. So we are likely to see that in some parts, it will want to concede to uh, a particular ethnic armed group when it is under vulnerability. But we are not likely to see a large scale um, situation where the military decides to retreat all the way. Because, um, like I mentioned, there are so many barriers to this since the groups are not united. All right, Sarah, thank you very much for your time and your insight this morning. Sarah Yan, Associate Director at Control Risks.